This is MuggleCast, your Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts podcast covering everything about J.K. Rowling's magical world. This week's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 150,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash MuggleCast. Welcome to MuggleCast episode 280. Micah, Eric, and I are here this week, and joining us is Selena from Hypable.com. Yay! All of the listeners just, like, stood up and cheered. Whoa, why? Right? No? Because it was me? No? No. Uh Oh, (laughs) welcome back, Selena. We all love you that much, Selena. I stood up and cheered. (laughs) Um, Thank you, Micah. I can always count on you. (laughs) So uh, we have a little fun news to start out today's episode. Uh, This is July, and it's a huge month in the world of Harry Potter, uh, historically. And we're going to talk about all of the dates this day in history later in the episode. But this is also Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling's birthday month. They were both born on July 31st. So happy birthday, you two. You know Harry Potter's turning 35? Oh, yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> it's I prefer- it's so it's so odd. He yeah. turned fifteen when I turned fifteen, but somehow he's thirty five and I'm several years away. <laughs> so what is this sorcery? What it's is magic. this? Yeah, yeah I, for some reason I don't like thinking of the character Harry Potter as an adult. I prefer thinking of of him always as like a seventeen year old. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> well, this is like this like is getting into those... in your memory. It's just getting into those 19 years later territory, isn't it? Like, next couple of years, he'll be as old as he was in the epilogue. Oh, Maybe. Yeah. Well, we'll be at the epilogue. Oh, uh, when? When is no. that? There is a whole thing about it. September 1st, uh, 2017 at the King's Cross Station. A bunch of Harry Potter fans going to go and uh, see if they can spot <laughs> Harry, Ron, and Hermione as they <laughs> let their kids. J.K. Sounds... Rowling should show up there. It seems she only should right. totally, She should absolutely 100% show up. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if anybody's looking for an excuse to go to London, that's as good as any. Um, and J.K. Rowling turns, I believe, 23 this year. So happy mm, birthday yes. to you. you yeah, you're going to make her blush again, Andrew. <laughs> oh, Oh, we're going to get to that later on. <laughs> Something very big happened. If you don't follow me on Twitter, <laughs> you, you may not know this yet. Something very big happened to me earlier this month. So we're going to talk about that later on. But first, the news. Um, the Fantastic Beast cast is now in place. The final lead was found on July 10th. His name is Dan Fogler, and he is going to be playing Jacob who is Newt's rival, and we also learned that he's going to be a muggle. Ooh. I love this. Do you guys Why? love this? I Why think it's amazing. This? Well, because well, we've never had a muggle in the story before. Well, if you don't count the Dursleys, you know, but I mean, this is going to be, this is just another clue that Fantastic Beast is going to be a lot more, not realistic, I guess isn't the right word, but you know, a lot more gritty, real life Kind Different. of, you know, adults, See, muggles. Now, in the 1920s, the period setting is going to be completely, uh, you know, I don't want to say off-putting, completely different. And the idea that a muggle could be a rival to a wizard zoologist. I love that. I think that's amazing. You know, or maybe he's a rival in a different faction, but just that muggles are a part of the story. Yeah. So we still don't know much about this Jacob character, but I was guessing in my Hypable article that maybe Jacob will be jealous of Newt's magical abilities because well, you Newt... really loved the, like the, your theory that they were like lovers or something that didn't pan out. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't think they're going to play lovers now. I liked the werewolf theory myself, uh, but that didn't is, happen. What's that theory again? Oh, you know that he'd be played by same same guy who played Jacob Taylor Lautner in uh, in oh. Twilight, <laughs> and they would be skin changers and have some fun in the full moon. But that that was just my my personal theory. I didn't. That's a fan fiction waiting to happen. Know anything about it? Um, so no, new but... documents creatures, magical creatures. So how is Jacob going to be the rival? That's the question right well, now. Well, he's probably also documenting creatures, and he's trying to get the magical creatures noticed by muggles because they're creatures, and he sees them. And he's like, oh, a new species. And, and he's like, no, you can't. 
that are magic that you can't see though. Like that's that's kind of like that's... muggles are at a clear disadvantage. Like there's probably places uh and you know entire areas of the world that he just cannot see because I'm muggles just thinking, you know, cannot. surely every time like a dragon flies over a big city, someone's gonna look up and someone's mm-hmm. gonna be like, Hmm, what's that bird? <laughs> and then, and then, you know, maybe he's he's that and he's trying to to make them known to muggles and Newt has to convince him not to. Mm. I, don't know. I mean, I don't remember know. what happened with the Fort Anglia. Snape <laughs> reprimands. Exactly. You were seen by no less than seven <laughs> muggles. Uh, I just saw that. It's been Harry Potter weekend on uh, on ABC Family yet again. And uh, <laughs> I love cool. how many people I see on social media watching Harry Potter weekend, including oh, yeah. my friend who's also a big Muggle cast listener, Elizabeth. She's all she's this weekend she's been Snapchatting it, tweeting about it. Yep. <laughs> yep. I get Snapchats all the time. People just drop what they're doing and spend the entire weekend in front of the TV. It's pretty cool. So just as a reminder, Eddie Redmayne is going to play Newt. Catherine Waterston is going to play Newt's eventual wife, Tina, and Allison Subtle will play Queenie. Tina's sister. This is another casting we received in the past week. Actually, the the news came down just the day before we learned about who's playing Jacob. So Queenie, like I just said, is the the sister of, of Tina. So those are the four leads. It seems like it's going to be kind of like a, a family let driven story plus this rival. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a feeling the anytime there's a rival involved, they're going to have to work together at some point. Uh, Something's gonna happen. Well, yeah, because so if Jacob is one of the leads, then presumably he's going to be in the the full trilogy. So yeah, that would yeah, assuming he, he is makes it. Some kind of villain who's trying to like expose them. Is it is it just me or I can't I still can't see a dark side to this story yet. Like, what's gonna make this story interesting? You know, the, well the that's 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 escapes. where my whole theory comes in yeah 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 like like beasts escape and like threaten new york and and then like jacob ha- no what's his face newt has to like like save the muggles but make sure they don't find out and then jacob finds out and it's this whole like mm. you know exposing magic to new york in the tw- 30s like people ah. have a right to know I don't, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> which is more like of like a 60s version mentality of or 70s Pretty mentality much. yeah so those are the four leads, but now the crew is moving on to casting other parts, and they held an open casting call for a role of a young character named Modesty. Mm. They did this in London earlier this month. They're looking for an eighteen or sorry, an eight to twelve year old girl with an inner strength and stillness. She has an ability to see deep into people and understand them. So they held a casting call. Uh, according to this report I'm reading on MuggleNet, approximately 14,000 young girls and their families showed up to audition, most of them waiting hours in line uh, before getting the just chance. Just a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so huge turnout. I mean, is A, this may be a big indication of how popular Fantastic Beasts is going to be. And B, this, of course, reminds us of the open casting call they held for Luna Lovegood back in the Harry Potter days. Yes. Um, in fact, Ivana wrote an article on her Facebook, like a very positive, uh, heartwarming message to pretty much everybody. It was mostly to the young girls who were trying out, but then she also had a funny bit at the end about if you're a boy or too old or have already been cast, which she mm-hmm. has, then sorry, but maybe there'll be more opportunities in the future. But she, she wrote a really heartwarming post about how it can change you and how the magic um, of being cast in the films changed her. And how she found out about it on MuggleNet. And actually, we we oh. managed to collect a lot of really nice, um, like updates and good footage, photographs of people standing in line, photographs of actually uh, a mother sent a picture of her daughters who, or her daughter and her daughter's friend who were finalists or something, and they had like their uh, certificates up and stuff. It's it was just kind of like a really cool, also short notice. I'm thinking two three days in advance. This report came out or this announcement mm-hmm. uh, that that the casting call would be held. And um, it was just really a a big movement of, of hopefuls and and just knowing that it's really up to, we don't know what they're looking for, you know? I mean, at least with, with Luna, there was some, 
uh, examples in the book and that these girls are going into it completely blind. Um, you know, yeah. who knows, who knows what modesty, I mean, there is a short description. Modesty as a character is a described as being a haunted eight to 12 year old girl with an inner strength and stillness. She I has have, an ability I have the to perfect s- person for this. Who is this? I it actually, she may be a bit older. I'm not sure exactly, but, um, mm-hmm. uh, most of you will know, and some of our listeners will know Carrie Ingram who played Shireen Baratheon oh, in Game yeah. of Thrones. Yes. I think she would be really good for this part, actually. For some She'd reason, be great. that description makes me think this character is going to have some sort of like mind control powers or something. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was like... thinking the same thing. <laughs> well, she it's, the description continues. She has an ability to see deep into people and understand them. She might be like a young seer or, or fortune tellery person. I, I think... what I really like about this casting call too is that after. Each person auditioned, they were given this little certificate that said this is to this is to certify that name of person took part in the casting process for the role of uh, modesty in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And it says uh, the text is really small, but it's it's also a little note it just says thank you for coming out and it says signed the casting team of Fantastic Beasts. So that's it's kind of like getting your own Hogwarts letter. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I I'm reading I'm reading more of the font here. It says, uh, we hope you will continue to enjoy your acting endeavors in and school and as your local drama group something 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 uh cinemas next year. So this enjoy is a very very year. good yeah yeah yeah, very good uh pr- promo for the movie in general. I mean 14,000 It's such a nice callback. Yeah, I mean, you know, because this do movie things. doesn't strike you as being about children, right? It's like Harry Potter. It's like oh, who's going to be Harry, Ron, Hermione, Shane, uh, Seamus, Dean, Neville. You know, all the people, all the schoolmates, and everything. This movie seems to be much more adult centric, but there's still an opportunity for a child, an unknown uh, girl, to come in and, like and be that. part of the the film. All right, well, watch this space. Maybe we'll hear about the role of mod- modesty in the next month or so is callbacks happen so so we're gonna we have more news to talk about today including uh chris columbus the director of the first two harry potter movies he's out promoting (laughs) pixels right now and he made some interesting comments that i think a lot of people are for Uh, (laughs) surprisingly yeah but first i want to remind everybody that today's episode is brought to you by audible.com the internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 150,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including audio versions of many New York Times bestsellers. For listeners of MuggleCast, Audible is offering you a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their great service. And today I'm going to recommend the book of the summer, maybe? I, I, I just said New York Times bestsellers. Uh-oh. Go set a watchman. Uh-oh. Ah, the new book <laughs> from Harper Lee, whether she wanted it out there or not. Uh, this audiobook is interesting because it was performed by Reese Witherspoon, huh. who we all loved in Wild. Yeah. Oh, I love that movie so much. Another book you have to read. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ghost at a Watchman is, of course, the sequel of sorts to To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, it has been very popular this summer. It broke records on Amazon. I believe it broke a record uh, previously held by... Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Oh. Yeah, it's true. I'm Damn gonna... it, Harper Lee. Well, it's been eight <laughs> years, but still. <laughs> uh, here it is. Uh, Ghost of the Watchmen gathered as many pre-orders as Deathly Hallows did. Oh, on Amazon. okay. Wow. All right. So now we just have to wait for J.K. Rowling's, like, in, in 50 years, her book about Harry and how he was a horrible person, and it'll... <laughs> right, that she <laughs> probably didn't back. want released. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, uh, Ghost of the Watchmen, like I said, it's the prequel of sorts, or sorry, the sequel to To Kill a Mockingbird. It was originally, it, Harper Re- Lee wrote this first, and then something happened in Ghost of the Watchmen that the public, her editor was like, oh, let's do a story on this part. Yeah. And then that's how To Kill a Mockingbird came to be. So, uh, the reviews are good for this book, actually. There's been a little bit of controversy, but everybody's very interested in Ghost of the Watchmen because this is Harper Lee's only other book mm. and it's a part of the to kill a mockingbird world yeah she's so, kind of a reclusive author you know people didn't really know that she was still around what she was doing and she's yeah. she's had this story in I, a vault or a trunk or something of sorts for yeah for years before they kind of coaxed it 
coaxed her to to publish it. Yeah, it's re- the you should. We don't really have time to talk about this today, but you <laughs> should you should check out the whole story behind this book's release. It's kind of it's kind of sad. Not that this is selling the book well, but you can get this book <laughs> or any other book, any other popular book this summer on Audible for free. Go to audiblepodcast dot com slash MuggleCast. And uh, thank you, Audible, for your support of the show. Yeah. You know, Andrew, one thing uh, I just thought of when you were reading through the the beginning portion of that ad, um, it, we've been around now for, for almost 10 years. But if Jesus. if you go back and listen, the number of downloadable titles available across the years is pretty interesting to see that, that, that it's gotten to 150,000. Yeah. And maybe yeah. that's just from having transcribed the show. But the fact that, you know, it would go from like, 50, 50 to 100 to 150 it yeah. makes us feel like we've been around for quite a long time well it's because of audiobooks i think are growing in popularity just like podcasts are growing in popularity and uh audible is just the place to go for audiobooks there's no other great audiobook service audible is it which is really cool anyway moving on with the news now um like i said like i teased Chris Columbus wants to direct Harry Potter movies that are set after the events of Deathly Hallows, but before Yay! the prequel. Or sorry, the the the, the no, epilogue. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I'm confusing my Harper Lee story. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he said, "I would love to go back and do another one. Not Fantastic Beasts as much, which I think is going to be amazing, but I would love to do another movie with those three characters: Harry, Hermione, and Ron." I'm just fascinated about what happened to them after the end of the last movie, because then they cut to 18 years ahead. There's 18 years there of great Harry Potter stories. Yeah, and that's what <laughs> fan fiction is for, Mr. Columbus. Uh, 18 so- years of Harry changing diapers and, <laughs> um, you know, getting getting the job at the ministry for Hermione and him becoming an R when there's no evil dark wizard out there. Well, this I mean, I'm sure- amazing. This made yeah. me think that he's right. There are actually interesting stories there because they all three of them did go to work in the ministry. But the question right. is, do we need it? Splats, you know, splashed on a screen and 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 explicitly played out in front of our faces. Like I don't know if we, because I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, um, I, I I make no secret of the fact that I'm more of a book fan than a movie fan. So just the fact that he would put these stories, even more of this imagination, sort of filled world and plaster it on a screen and go here you go this is exactly well, it, what it is i'm like no. would, if he were to do it it would be without uh source material written by jk rowling unless she was involved i mean she, unless she, she was involved but like she's you in know, screenwriting so now <laughs> yeah she's also into playwriting um but uh <laughs> yeah. i i uh yeah I'd, I'd be really interested um in having like if chris columbus were to have done a another harry potter film that would have been I Chris Columbus not. isn't the worst choice. I think that's what most people are sort of in agreement on. I've seen comments on Hypable um, saying that if anyone was going to do it, it was him. I think that's an interesting. I I, a- I really like that. I I really like that. I like that he's feeling so far after Harry Potter because it's been 13 years since his last film came out. I mean, he produced uh, the third one and perhaps others. But uh, it's been so long, and he still feels a connection to the characters. That's yeah. really cool to me. Um, especially again after Harry Potter weekend on ABC fan watching the the first two movies on repeat with the bonus scenes stuck back in um, they are just, very magical aren't they like yeah. don't you think that his movies were really like I don't know they had something something wonder wondrous about them mm-hmm. Harry's wondrous world is a title yeah. as I wrote in the article I mean ar- arguably this is the most – his two films, Harry Potter films, were the most whimsical of the series. They yeah. were. It's just, yeah, they were. It's just true. It's just a fact. Yeah, they I mean, captured some of that some of that wonder of the of the story, I think. And I mean Chris's uh entire range as a director ha- is is a good one. I mean, he also directed uh like Mrs. Doubtfire and Rent which are are quite different and still emotional. They have cores, but they deal with bigger issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so and don't he forget could presumably, Home Alone. Yeah. And Home Alone. <laughs> yeah, well, he, so he, he, he could Mike. deal. I want to see Joe Pesci and, and, and Daniel Stern in the uh, Wizarding World as uh, as like sort of Mundungus Fletcher knockoff. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, 
Yeah, but I I mean, you're right. I mean, he has that ability to create those types of movies, thinking also to Night at the Museum and and, uh, even I'm looking right now at his IMDb. I didn't know he did Percy Jackson, but again, that's in the same type of Oh, he genre. did. I didn't know yeah. that. Either. I don't think he directed it. He was a producer. Producer. Oh. Okay. Uh, but he was involved in some capacity. And I think that knowing that he has that ability uh, to possibly help tell the story after Deathly Hallows comes to a, a conclusion but- would be interesting. But yeah, I, I was going to add a but too. And, and that is, <laughs> I, I'd rather it come directly from J.K. Rowling in some sort of written format. I think that we feel that way at, at this point that. We don't necessarily need another film or another series of films. And I think, you know, the fact that we're even getting them with Fantastic Beasts is is great. But uh, as far as Harry's story, I, I feel like I'd, I'd want to hear directly from Joe. And I, I think a lot of us thought that we would be getting that with Pottermore. Uh, hmm. and, and we all know that we have differing opinions on it. But generally, the sense, at least that I've gotten over the years since Pottermore has been around, is that it hasn't quite fulfilled expectations. Well, well can I ask you? Oh, go on. Go on. Uh, it's interesting that he said between the epilogue, like between the end of book seven and the epilogue of book seven, uh, for his story rather than after the epilogue, because pretty much everything you need to know about that is that all was well, right? I mean, the last words of the Harry Potter series are. All yeah, was clearly well. all was well between the end of Deathly Hallows and the epilogue. If they're all safely standing on a platform with their children. right, nothing, nothing too uh, consequential could have happened with maybe uh, Voldemort wannabes, some street kids, you know, mm-hmm. trying to be as bad as he was. But yeah, well, can I ask you something just before we we move on? Or um, because I, I'm really really curious about this because obviously, as you say, like Chris Columbus is is great, and 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 there are stories still to be told, but. I feel like with with J.K. Rowling having said so many times that she is done with Harry, you know, that if any other story she does in The Wizarding World, she doesn't want to go back to to Harry necessarily because she feels like she wrapped up his story. And as as she has herself has said, like, aside from fun little, you know, article type posts that she did on Pottermore or whatever, like Harry's story is told. So if we're not going to get a book... Because I would, I would be, I would be all for a book. I would also be a little bit afraid <laughs> of it, sort yeah. of, so, sort of soiling the experience. But soiling—that's a bad word. Sullying the experience—that's <laughs> better. Um, Either word works. But yeah, okay. So, um, but but if we're not going to get a book, I mean, would we really? Would you guys really want a movie like no, with or without no. J.K. Rowling's involvement? Obviously, if she's involved, that's much better. There's but do so you actually cool. want more? No, there's so many logistical obstacles for it that like this thing that Chris has just said that has inspired us all and excited us all is, <laughs> is like completely improbable for it to happen because think about the actors you need to get back. Like it, yes. it wouldn't be worth seeing unless you got the trio back right. for it. I that's mean, the biggest be in, problem. Like, their stupid makeup from the epilogue and like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> that, hey, I mean, you know, you could actually just show them as they are because it's been 15 years or uh, wow, I'm way <laughs> off. It's been like well. it's been, like five, five, ten years. <laughs> the, so the like you could. Is- the biggest problem because Dan Radcliffe has done so much work to distance himself from Harry Potter. Yeah, he would never yeah. go back. And and fans, viewers would not accept a different Harry Potter set after Deathly Hallows. Yeah, the movie would I be dead. I just don't want them to pump this, this, like, I want some part of it to still be sacred. I feel like they've right. done a lot. And it will be. Because yeah. Chris Columbus only said this to promote his right, new right, movie right. Pixels. Yeah. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> I'm going to go see his movie Pixels because he said he wanted to do more right. Harry Potter films. <laughs> um, but uh, well, one idea I had for how they could do it with the different actors, if they did it like they do James Bond films, <laughs> the actor oh, playing Jesus. Harry Potter will rotate and he and Ron <laughs> will go on missions as ours. Uh, to mm. defeat uh, mm. a Blofeld type wizard, um, you know, out out in a in a factory somewhere. That would I be give really- it twenty years, and then that's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> well, right. I think in twenty years, there's a possibility that they'll be remade in some capacity. But oh yeah, that's that, that, I want that, I want that, that television series. I really do. But Selena, I I do agree with you. I, I I'm not really looking for anything else, and and I'm fine with J.K. Rowling saying the story is over. Uh, you know, and, and or his story has been told, and there's really nothing more to say. I mean, outside of her going in depth on other characters that were a part of the the series and and places and spells and things like that, 
Uh, I think we got a lot of that out of Pottermore. There's probably still more to tell. I know there was talk about Encyclopedia for a long time that we've still never hoping. seen. Uh, yeah, still hoping, fingers crossed. And I think, generally speaking, a lot of Potter fans would be content with the, that Encyclopedia and not have a need for anything more than that. All right, well, let's move on. So there was a big thing that happened earlier this month, or sorry, late last month now. Uh, we've all known that there's been a Harry Potter stage play in development, and the last time we heard of it, uh, we knew J.K. Rowling was officially involved, and we heard that it was going to follow Harry in the years before he got his Hogwarts letter. Mm. And that that officially came out. There was a description, and we were all like, uh, this is weird, because did anything even really happen in his years under the cupboard? Like... This just doesn't make sense. So, flash forward to June 26th of last month, we found out the Daily Mail, who broke the news originally about this stage play, so we could trust them as a source for once, uh, reported that the show is called Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, and it's going to open on London's West End next summer at London's Palace Theatre, and tickets are going on sale this fall. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Uh, first, uh, but title aside, <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. according to the report, the Daily Mail, the, cur- the quote, the cursed child delves into what, into what happened to Harry's parents, Lily Evans Potter and James Potter, before they were killed by Lord Voldemort, forcing an infant Harry to be raised in miserable circumstances by his, sister's mother, by his mother's sister, Petunia, her horrid husband, Vernon, and their spoiled son, Dudley. Now... So this sounds like a prequel of sorts. It's going to follow <laughs> Lily and James. That's awesome. It was super sure. exciting. <laughs> but then J.K. Rowling, so everybody started saying, oh, it's a prequel. It's a prequel. It sounds like a prequel. This is a trust. I mean, we can. Tr- I believe we can trust the Daily Mail in this case. But then flash forward to a couple days later after J.K. Rowling starts hearing people say, oh, it's a prequel. It's a prequel. She starts saying on Twitter, guys, it's not a prequel. It's not a prequel. Yeah, not only that. She says it like 20 times. <laughs> she did like 20 separate tweets, right, Selena? She did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very funny. Um, it was very funny because like, we started, you know, you wrote up the post and like, wow, this is, you know, about James and uh, or Petunia and Harry's time with, with the Dursleys. And then... Um, there was some kind of update and I was like, Oh my God, new, new stuff, new stuff. It's not a prequel. So I like changed the entire post and then <laughs> you see it and you're like, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> and it all goes back. And then the day after JK Rowling releases this slew of new tweets about it and it's just a big mess. I, I, the, the other thing is that there was an official description about this play out over a year ago. So why not just come clean about what it is now? If you already announced what it was a year and a half ago or whatever. Well, did I, yeah. they announce that? Like, what, Did that come from Daily Mail or did that come from them? No, that came from J.K. Rowling officially. Mm-hmm. I, I'll try okay. to pull up the statement. But she had she made an announcement after the Daily Mail had broken it uh, two Decembers ago. Okay, so how how do we think this is, can avoid being a prequel? She's, or is J.K. So screwing with us all? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna ta- I'm gonna table that option because because of her her fiery resistance. Uh, didn't she say it really really isn't a prequel? Not a prequel? Not at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is an anti prequel. Okay, what is an anti prequel? Let's if if we if you wrap our head an around an anti prequel is a sequel, but unless <laughs> an, Chris Columbus is directing it, let's a not. story <laughs> that's against telling the the backstory would be an anti prequel. Here, here's me. here's what um the statement was back in December 2013. I believe it was 2013. What was it like to be the boy in the cupboard under the stairs? This brand new play, which will be developed for the UK theater, will explore the previously untold story of Harry's early years as an orphan and outcast. Featuring some of our favorite characters from the Harry Potter books, this new work will offer unique insight into the heart and mind of the now legendary young wizard. A seemingly ordinary boy, but for one whom destiny has plans. But that's a prequel. (laughs) <laughs> like that, that's, yeah. well, that's obviously a and prequel. for me i mean i've always felt if it's harry before he gets his hogwarts letter there's almost no story there 
how could you tell a story? Uh, it's 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 unclear how often characters like Dumbledore checked up on him. Uh, although well, it we would know probably that- just be him and and the Dursleys and him trying to make his way and going to school and being like, I wish I was a special boy. You know those kinds of things, like <laughs> typical Hollywood twist type stuff. Yeah. And then what's with the title, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child? <laughs> Harry Potter is the Cursed Child, right? Yes, isn't he? I mean, I thought it should just be called the Cursed Child because, I, and I actually like, I would like that title if it were. I have the a theory. Cur- the Cursed Child. Go but on. Go on. I just want to say because because we talked a lot about this is one of the things on on hypeable as well, and then I'll shut up after that. But um, I was thinking a lot about this, like what the hell? This is totally redundant. But then I thought. If it is kind of like in the past, right? And if it is kind of let's let's pretend like our definition of prequel isn't like J.K. Rowling's definition of prequel. Um, <laughs> I think that so, that much is clear. That much yeah. is already reality. So, so 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 this would take place at a time where, when if Harry was a baby, um, it would take place at a time where they were still trying to figure out which child was cursed. Was it Neville? Was it Harry? Was it some other mm-hmm. kid? Like who is Trelawney's mm-hmm. prophecy talking about? So it would be Harry Potter because Harry Potter is the character where it's it's all centered around, but it would be and the cursed child because the cursed child is like a mystery. Like who is the cursed child? They don't know. We know, but they don't know. I, I that's, th- that's the only thing I could think. Gosh, calling it Harry Potter and is just gonna sell more tickets. It's that simple. Exactly. It, it comes exactly down to that. You could yep. call and it the- I can't I can't live with the fact that you, it would you, be a I know, I can't time. either, Selena. <laughs> I feel my heart hurts, but you could call it the cursed child, just the cursed child. Uh, so and so presents the cursed child. West or Ends. Harry Potter is the new cursed production. Child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just call it cursed child. Have everyone in the entire world know because everyone who follows the internet, whatever, know that it is the next Harry Potter iteration. That it's a Harry Potter play. That it's called the cursed child. It almost loses something if you're calling it Harry Potter and the cursed child. Not to mention the redundancy. It's just it should be the cursed child. A look at uh, the famous boy wizard before he was a famous or a wizard or you know and just a boy. Unless we've got all of this wrong and it's something completely different, and we're I'll just going to be so surprised. It's not a prequel. <laughs> so the other thing, and yes, why I don't want to spend too much time on this is because we're supposed to be. They said we're going to hear more in late July. And we're recording on July 26th, so knowing our luck, they're going to officially announce all the details on July 27th. Yeah. Welcome to MuggleCast, episode 281, <laughs> recorded the next day. Yeah. So, um, um, so yeah, they did say late July, so uh, we may be hearing more details about this soon. I, w- I want this to be a prequel. <laughs> But but by definition, it is a prequel. Whether she wants to view it that way or not, it if just I I looked up the definition of prequel just so I have Miriam Webster on my side. It says (laughs) Don't say anything you're gonna regret here, Micah. I know that she didn't quite tweet you back the way she tweeted Andrew back, and you might be angry, but don't say anything you're gonna regret. (laughs) Well, it's not like she's coming on the show anyway. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to tweet that at her after the uh, <laughs> show. So You're a cursed child. <laughs> it's a literary, dramatic, or film work whose story precedes that of a previous work by focusing on events that occur before the original narrative. A prequel is a work that forms part of a backstory to the preceding work. Well, that's why I think this description is BS. Like, I think it's, I know, I know, like, it came from them, but then, then they've changed their minds. Like, then it's something different. I really believe that if she says it's not a prequel, it's not a prequel. Like, I really believe it. I don't think it, it, if it involves, if it informs even a little bit of the plot, uh, that leads, that is like. I know. Prior to leading <laughs> into the, it's a if this is if this is about Harry Potter at all, it is by definition <laughs> a prequel, or would seem to be. But here's here's more of J.K. Rowling's own words on the subject because there's one tweet that I think is a little uh, uh, not ominous but like ambig- ambiguous. Um, it says it will tell, an, she says it will tell a new story, which is the result of a collaboration between writer Jack Thorne, director John Tiffany, and myself. And then she says to answer one inevitable. And reasonable, in parentheses, question, why isn't Cursed Child a new novel? She says, I am confident that when audiences see the play, they will agree that it was the only proper medium for the story. So she's saying that, prequel or not, that th- that whatever this is, whatever this Cursed Child is, this story could, n- for some reason, 
by design could not have been told on paper. And mm-hmm. that makes me wonder what kind of... And really, st- unfortunately, it's not a musical. <laughs> I, would, I would pay to see that. We have three Harry Potter musicals. That's true, and they are three amazing. hours long each, so... Yeah. That's that's covered, but I don't know, guys. I really think like my stand, like my final stance on this is that when she says it's not a prequel, it's because it's no, it's in no way ties into Harry's story. So either it's him befriending like some kid in school and being off and like totally non magical adventures, or it's not about Harry at all. And the title is just kind of I don't know. I think I think she's she's right, and I think J.K. Rowling's sort of brilliant way of of making us believe one thing and then turning out to be another thing is like what's happening here. And we're going to be totally surprised. I think it's going to be coming down to semantics. Okay. I, I, <laughs> well, it's no, not so fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll find out soon. Hopefully <laughs> Harry Potter and the prequel. That's what the yes. stage play should have been called. <laughs> Harry so, Potter and the not a prequel. Our final news <laughs> item for today is about Pottermore. So Pottermore unveiled Deathly Hallows, the final book in the series, on June 23rd, uh, they released all the chapters. Remember at the beginning, they were releasing just a few chapters at a time. And mm-hmm. then towards the uh, – in the back half of the series, they were just releasing all the books at once. And, well, you know, I, I hate to keep harping on this, but it was a bit of a disappointment. Pottermore's Deathly Hollow section included 15 moments for the Harry, final Harry Potter books, 37 chapters. Within those 15 moments, five of them have new writing from Rowling. Pretty pathetic. Yeah. Wow. The author's new writings include thoughts on the Dursleys and their final moments in the series. Uh, J.K. Rowling wrote, I wanted to suggest in the final book that something decent, a long forgotten but dimly burning love of her sister, w- the realization that she might never see Lily's eyes again, almost struggled out of Ampetunia when she said goodbye to Harry for the last time, but that is, but that she is not able to admit to it or show those long buried feelings. So, a couple interesting little tidbits there. But I feel like she said that before, though. Probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So five things out of the 37 chapters. This is the last book. This is the book that everything else was supposedly leading up to. Right. I, you, would have, to you would have copious amounts of evidence of pre-planning and be like, this is why this happened. This is why the camping was so long. This is why. You know, I, I really wanted some in-depth personal in, insight analysis into why the seventh book is the way that it is. Yeah. Um, well, and think about, about how camping. many big moments in Deathly Hallows – uh, I'm not blaming J.K. Rowling. I'm no, blaming no. Pottermore. Like, how about on Dobby? Why didn't? Why wasn't there something Dobby, cool about Dobby? The Gringotts escape, Edward. all of that. The Ministry of Magic uh, plotting. Every everything about that. Really, there was so much. There is there is a richness of the story in there well, where you could go think, further into detail. Do we think either she is saving it because we're still holding out hope for the damn <laughs> encyclopedia, yeah. or? Is it really just a case of Pottermore clearly wasn't the success that they thought it was going to be and they just want to wrap it up? I, th- I think it's – I think there's – we shouldn't discount the possibility that Pottermore, because it has to continue to exist – it's a company, right? It has to continue to exist and put out content – that they're going to go back and add more moments in for previous chapters. I'm not sure if there's like a precedent uh, for them doing that before with other things, but like – it's been confirmed that we were supposed to get that we were supposed to get a Patronus test. Somebody, I think, even J.K. Rowling, J.K. Rowling said that was said in the works multiple times now that a Patronus yes, test. a Patronus test. So, and the, they closed the series without that on Pottermore. It's something that is. I mean, if we're going to take her at her word, it's going to be developed and, and put on there in the future. So perhaps there will. This was just the, sort of the first run through the the series of books, and well, you'll get so, more writing from J.K. Rowling uh, going. Go on. They they. I wrote to Pottermore and I said, is this it <laughs> in terms of Deathly mm-hmm. Hallows? Uh, and they said more original content is coming to the site in the coming months, but this is all that they're releasing for Deathly Hallows. So, yes, they'll add the Patronus test, but is that going to come inside of a chapter? I don't think so. I think they're going to add it Maybe it'll come outside. on Harry's birthday. Oh, maybe. Uh... <laughs> That's a nice thought. But <laughs> Random guess. Getting back to I, this, surely was not the original plan. The original plan was release a few chapters at at a time for every book, include some good stuff. You know, even at the beginning, the stuff was fine. It wasn't 
fantastic. It was, but it was good. It was kind of cool. Like I remember what Minerva McGonagall maybe backstory. But was sure, like one of the yeah. first things. surely the plan back several years ago in 2011 wasn't okay. And with the final book, we're going to release all the chapters at once and release five things written by J.K. Rowling, and that's it. For, for in terms of that book, that that book was too many years in the making for there to only be five things to say yeah, about it. Right, uh, especially that she ha- hasn't already said in interviews and stuff. Like I get that, but yeah, so, there has to be more. Well, so more is coming to Pottermore, but it's mm-hmm. just in terms of the books, this and this is what Pottermore said to me. This is it. Maybe they meant immediately, like in case there was some confusion over whether more chapters were coming somehow or more moments. Know. Maybe like for the foreseeable future. I specifically asked them, is this it for Deathly Hallows? And they said yes. Yeah. So That is unfortunate, because like, I think you brought up a really good point, Eric, that Deathly Hallows was a place where she could have really gone back and done some kind of retrospective and been like, okay, well, I set this up in book three and blah, 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 you know? Yeah, I think I, it, I, I think it a, partly a reader, has to I do with that. what you said, Selena, that Pottermore hasn't been the success that they were envisioning. So I think mm. plans changed over the past couple of years, and maybe J.K. Rowling wasn't happy with certain aspects, and they decided to change, you know, because of her disappointment, they decided to change things up. Who knows? Yeah, and now she's going to be a musical instead, or a play. <laughs> Probably more of the play. <laughs> and, I, I, and I know understand she's busy um, right now, <laughs> writing, uh, or having finished writing Fantastic, that she had a lot of other stuff get in the way of what could have been potentially contributing to Pottermore, but this is something where they came at us with this bold uh, directive, this goal, yeah. this game plan. Um, I'll never forget her first, her video about, uh, you know, sort of announcing Pottermore and, and how ambitious it seemed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would have liked that, that fire to, you know, remain constant uh, throughout the whole. Well, you can tweet her and let her know. Uh, yeah. But- so, well- Art. I agree, though. I just wanted to say that I think that, to your point, Andrew, the clearly the plan changed because when you're only releasing a few chapters at a time, it allows for the author to slowly write and plan out what she wants to do. But if you get to the point where you're releasing entire books at a time, there's only so much that you could possibly provide. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of this material – already exists and it's just a matter of putting it in the right format but i feel like maybe it allowed her early on to move at a a slower pace when you're releasing it chapter by chapter or multiple chapters at a time when you're doing an entire book Mm -hmm. uh there's only so much that that you can look to get in before the book itself gets released so we asked on Twitter and Facebook, twitter.com slash mugglecast and facebook.com slash mugglecast, what would you like to see on Pottermore now that it's all finished or now that the books are out? Of course, a lot of people said the Patronus quiz because J.K. Rowling has promised that. Um, Kelly said, finally, more on the Marauders. Mm. That's something I think a lot of people were hoping for. Yeah. Um, Christina said, and this this goes for... Uh, all three of the final books i'd love more chapters for book f- five and six patronus quiz history of hogwarts maybe a better search option mm. um a twitter account called harry potter forever said excerpts from the textbooks used at hogwarts that would be cool totally agree nicole said i would take any quiz really who would my friends be what quidditch position should i play who died so i can see th- thestrals <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then those were from Twitter over on Facebook. Ashley said, and this was the most liked comment on our Facebook thread, more moments. Those seemed rushed. And I like the idea of 19 years later moments. Also lists of characters, Patronuses and meanings behind Patronuses like did, like they did with one cores and such maybe details on how the love potion would smell to different characters an interactive Marauders map, like a virtual tour of Hogwarts. God. So oh, Ashley God. had a bunch of ideas. Um, and Debbie echoing uh, Christina on Twitter, need many more moments for books th- five through seven. And Sabrina said, I was really surprised there wasn't a moment for 19 years later. Seriously, like, that's nuts. <laughs> that's the last you get. That's the, in that's fact, true. that really upsets me because she has to, I think, own up to the fact that she didn't end the book with Scar. Um, <laughs> because she said Stop. she would for years and 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 years, and years. 
And then yeah. it was like, oh, by the way, I changed my mind. In like an interview, she was like, ah, oh, yeah, it didn't really work out. But I wanted to hear all about how the original line of the books was going to be Scar. So just call it Potter Less and move on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The final moment should have just been a page that just had the, the word Scar. Scar. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining Pottermore. Scar. On this Scar. journey. Scar. <laughs> so thank you to everybody for those responses. Mm. And that's it for Pottermore. So we're going to play favorites this week. Micah had a good idea based on some of our uh, discussions this episode. Yeah, and uh, I can't remember over the other 279 episodes if we ever did this, but um, it does tie into the discussion we were having earlier about Chris Columbus. I wanted to know favorite director of the Harry Potter films. Obviously, there have been four, right? Chris Columbus, Alfonso Cuaron, Mike Newell, and... David Yates. David Yates. I uh, think we probably have, but like Pottermore, our ideas can change over time. Mm. My current, I, I think Alfonso Cuaron was the most innovative director for the Harry Potter series because of what he did. He laid the groundwork for the remaining films in terms of the the look, the look of the film series. Mm. But my favorite director was David Yates. For what he did, particularly with Half Blood Prince and Deathly Hallows Part Two, I mean those films were just—I I loved those movies because they really brought a sense of darkness to the Harry Potter film series and a sense of urgency. I mean, the war directing that war, I think, in Deathly Hallows Part Two was just incredible. So. Very Oscar worthy. Mm-hmm. Eric, um, who's your favorite director? I will. I will go next. I'm going to also agree. Actually, David Yates. Um, Chris Columbus is a is a very, very, very close second uh, for me because he's the man who had to work with the producer for the first time. You know, basically creating and and the way that he heralded the children. Uh, you know, basically getting what he needed out of them. Because if you look at the performances. It takes a really patient and strong guy to be able to... You know what? I'm changing my answer to Chris Columbus. It's Chris Columbus. For all those reasons I just... <laughs> um, the, the fact that he was able to do it first and and that it was so heartfelt and, and all of that. I, David Yates is extremely competent, and I love some of the shots uh, from the later films, like the one in uh, Grim Old Place where I think it's in movie five. It's looking up the stairwell. And different people are coming out of their rooms, like Fred and George are up above. Ginny's looking down. Like some of those shots just really blow me away. But Chris Columbus for being able to do it first, um, and 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 doing it so well, I mm-hmm. think working with those those young that young talent. Chris yeah, Columbus we heard made. a lot about how how difficult it was for Chris and the rest of the crew to balance, re, you know, letting these kids be normal kids, but also starring in this major film. Yeah. You know, they could only work for a certain number of hours per day. Uh, they had to get school schooling while on set. So it, it was a massive struggle. In addition to directing, you just had to let these kids be kids. Mm-hmm. Selena, who's your favorite director? Well, I was um, I was thinking about this because because <laughs> uh, as as I said earlier, as we established, I'm not the the biggest fan of the movies. Uh, not because I don't think they were fantastic pieces of of technical prowess, but because, and I have a lot of respect for David Yates. I have a lot of respect for what he did, but I'm gonna have to say Chris Columbus, and it's not actually because I I, I mean I feel like those movies were very very. Like, wow, you know, it's Christmas, it's magic, it's home alone. Like, it was almost too <laughs> too much of, of Chris Columbus, you know what I mean? Mm. But what I do feel like he did capture best was the spirit of of magic, you know, the spirit of wonder. I feel like there's a lot of things that I really, really did like about the later movies, but one of the things that I never really felt was... It, it's, it's like I was gonna say I never forgave them, but that's that's a bit melodramatic. But was the fact that that the magic was turned mechanical? Like I feel like in the spirit of making things darker and making more sort of correlations to real life and making the kids feel more like real teenagers, it was almost like they sacrificed, in my opinion, the magic in favor of 
little gags and 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 making the wands look like guns and making like the staircases you know that was that was chris Columbus's fault but making the staircases move like you know like on hinges instead of actually like in the books where it was like oh on a tuesday they led to another floor um and that magic chris columbus did it best so i'm gonna give it to him but none of them got it the way i wanted it so i am gonna say nobody (laughs) wow (laughs) okay Damn. Wow! Damn. Well, you right. gotta be honest. You know what? You're ten years That's in. That's true. You can't it's fine. Keep around. Hey, you know what? You know I think it. a lot of people would agree with you too. So I mean, no I just I, it's just because true. I love the book so much, guys. You know, That's cool. totally fair. But, yeah. <laughs> Micah, how are you gonna top that? Uh, well, I I would have to agree uh, with Chris Columbus. Uh, th- you know, he really introduced the series uh, mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. Uh, a, a movie standpoint, and he. He did a great job. I mean, for all the points that have already been raised, I, I think he created the true sense of magic uh, that yeah. was lost in some way as the series progressed. And I understand that the characters are getting older, but I, I still think that looking back, it, he just he had a way of of bringing it to life that none of the others did. And I get it if the kids were younger, maybe it feels. A little bit more uh, whimsical. That was a word that was used. I think Eric used it, or, or Andrew did. But the other I thing did. is, you did okay. Uh, mm-hmm. He kept it. Uh, he kept it very close to the text, mm-hmm. and it, it, by far any of the a, any of the other um, movies, uh, Sorcerer's Stone and Chamber of Secrets, were the closest to the text. And I get that they were also the, the shortest. shortest books. Yeah, they, However. Yeah. However, there were definitely things that could have been included. I, I think that there were things created in later films that could have been taken out uh, that were that were never even in uh, the the series that could have been replaced by things that fans of the books were really looking forward to seeing. And I agree with Andrew um, about Alfonso and what he did, but him cutting the entire Marauder's backstory, which I'm I'm sure was not you know his decision alone. Uh, you know, for me, I, I can't kind of give him the nod. Um, and, and obviously the, the other movies that, that followed again, they, they just lacked some really memorable moments and, mm-hmm. and important plot points that I think we were all kind of looking forward to. Um, and, and even the fact that David Yates and, and the crew split the final film or final book into two films and still didn't really get everything in from a backstory standpoint uh, I, I felt like Dumbledore's backstory was very rushed and, and sometimes hard to follow especially mm-hmm. for those who may not have read the books um, I still confuse Grindelwald and Grigorovich <laughs> so <laughs> yeah I, I thought it was just the flashbacks and uh, you know the, the the sort of the experiences Harry's having and Voldemort's having it's, it oh, was just gosh. it was Snape quite confusing um, yeah so anyway I, I'd go with I'd go with Chris Columbus yeah, I do want to give a little bit of credit to Mike Newell just because I feel like he's so often overlooked. I know, you know, Goblet of Fire is not very many people's favorite movie or book, but I do think there was some there there was a bit of that sort of wonder in that movie, you know, like mm. I love magic as, as dumb as it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he got he got back <laughs> some of what uh, was dropped on the cutting room floor of the third movie, especially with the Yule Ball. Uh, yeah, it that was, yeah, was good. The, the Quidditch World Cup was good. Just throw in Christmas. Short. If you throw in Christmas, everything works out. <laughs> but you know what? Did, did you throw? Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? That just ruined everything. Was, was but then you had in the third one, one, you had things like, Shaking this, this heart is where you truly live. Like, they all have their flops. <laughs> this heart, you know all about the madness within. Won't, what, are you, what are you? Seriously? What? Um, you know, I, I have to say, I'm, I was surprised going through the movies for the very first time. I was surprised how well part one worked. Deathly Hallows part one. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's that, that movie actually works. The pacing is actually good and the camping isn't as annoying as it is in the book. Um, I was very, 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 very surprised by how that adaptation was released and, and, and no director is bad. No director did a, a poor job that wasn't without its merits. Um, and I think that's important to say. All right. Um, And I'm so glad that David Yates is taking on Fantastic Beasts. Me too. I am too. I I think think he's a good fit for that type of story. Yeah. And we know we're going to get a certain level of quality because he has all this experience. I'm just surprised he wants to do it. 
<laughs> so let's move on now. We have another game to play. We did this last episode, I believe, as well. Imperio Killing Curse Love Potion. So this is like FMK, but the Harry Potter version. So Eric, <laughs> who's first? Uh, let's see. Who wants to go first? I got ones for each of you. I'll go first. Okay, Andrew. Your three... Eric, who's first? I'll go first. Your, 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 your three candidates of uh, Imperio for Imperio Killing Curse Love Potion are... This is a little bit of a twist. So each of these candidates are a group, like or they're grouped together um, okay. by something that they have in common. So your three candidates for Imperio Killing Curse Love Potion are the Grey Lady, while she was alive, Nearly Headless Nick, while he was alive, and Moaning Myrtle, while she was oh alive. So they're ghosts... God. They're ghosts, but obviously a killing curse on a ghost wouldn't kill them. So I had to change it back to the gray lady nearly had the snick and moaning myrtle while they were still alive. Uh oh, well, I would definitely love potion the gray lady. Yeah, I I loved her. <laughs> um, I would imperio. Who are the other two? Nearly had the snick and nearly had the snick and moaning myrtle. I would imperio moaning myrtle because she is annoying. <laughs> and so you would uh, just shut her up yeah shut her up and poor I, nick though he hasn't done anything i know <laughs> that's what makes this tough i mean he's, he's such so a like, sweet a, yeah he just uh, wants to eat food and like be merry <laughs> wasn't there like a uh nearly headless nick plot that jk rowling cut from chamber of secrets or something i think so, so. i'll, I'll uh, kill him because i'm still angry about oh. her doing that well just make sure you you slice his head clean off this properly time. <laughs> clean off he'll, he'll thank you in his after yeah. nearly headless how can you be nearly, <laughs> nearly headless. Headless. like this <laughs> <laughs> love it all right who's one episode you guys do should just be like an entire recital of one of the movies i bet you could do it i i agree i totally agree <laughs> uh micah you go next okay micah <clears throat> all right your uh, your group here, your grouping, as you will soon find out, is uh, barkeeps. So you have Madame Rosmerta, Tom the bartender, and Aberforth Dumbledore, bartender yep. of the Hogshead. Uh, how do you? I do have a shared love of goats there, so you need to think about it's that. True. Love potion. Mm. Well, I I would Imperio Aberforth, um, so uh, <laughs> through him I can control the goat. <laughs> yeah, oh, there you yes. go. <laughs> then you would be I the would, goat king. I would, I would watch kill that Tom movie. <laughs> because uh, it, Tom is just not what? important. That's and, oh. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah and then love potion, Madame Rosmerta. Obviously. <laughs> All right, she's already had an Imperio thrown her way during the series, so don't want to do that to her again. But um. Okay, great. It's my and turn. uh Selena, you have Quidditch players. Oh fun. Uh, okay, so your Imperio Killing Curse love potion is Oliver Wood, Cedric Ooh. Diggory, Ooh. and Harry Potter. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm just gonna write off Killing Curse Cedric because of oh, Twilight. What? So <laughs> You're not gonna give him a reprieve? Uh, oh on. no, hell no. Um, he was annoying even before that. So. He's uh, he is a Hufflepuff, Puff, though. But you know, I mean, come on, loyal. guys. Guys, Sean, that's not even his name. Um, <laughs> I was the there. Sean Biggerstaff. Uh, Sean Biggerstaff. No, Oliver Wood is one of the most underappreciated hunks of the Harry Potter series. So I think I got yeah, a love he's... potion, that guy. Yeah, and then I didn't... all day and devises new strategies for them to practice. Yeah, no, yeah, I've just changed my mind. I can't Imperial Harry because he can get out of it. So I'm going to play it a little bit strategic here. Uh -huh. Love potion Harry, boy who lives. There you go. Sorry, Jenny. And I'm way too into this, guys. This is awful. And I, I would Imperial Oliver Wood and um, just leave it at that. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. Cool. It's horrible. Like Imperial people, what would you do with them? Like, yeah. that's, let's do not go down that thread. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, that was a good set of uh, topic er, characters. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. So now it's time for this month in Harry Potter history, our limited <laughs> event segment <laughs> for <laughs> for all of 2015, which I think it actually works well since this is also the 10th anniversary year of MuggleCast uh, as of next month. So, like I said at the beginning of this episode, July is a huge month in Harry Potter history, uh, and we're going to run through them all now. First of all, July second, nineteen ninety eight, was the year was the was the was when Chamber of Secrets was released in the UK. 
One year later, on July 8th, 1999, Prisoner of Azkaban was released in the UK. And then, July 8th, 2000, Goblet of Fire was published in the US and UK. Now, this was a, that. This was a that big was release. First. Yeah, for for every, this was kind of the the first major release. First of all, it was published in the U.S. and the U.K. on the same day. This was the first time that this happened for a Harry Potter book. It was the first midnight release, and it was also the final book where J.K. Rowling was working under a deadline. You guys may remember that she felt rushed while writing *Goblet of Fire*, and um, after that, she said, "Look, I'll finish these books when I feel like they're finished. I'm not going to commit to a deadline." Which was really smart. Do you guys remember what... I know Micah wasn't at a midnight release. Eric, were you for Goblet of Fire? No. Oh, you weren't either. Hmm. Just me yeah. and Selena, huh? Yeah. Selena, where yeah. were you? Hardcores. No, I was, I was back in Denmark. So I actually, this was like the first one that I caught up when I'd caught up with them. And I ordered... I remember this very specific stupid detail that I ordered it from Amazon. Or my mom did. But then it didn't arrive in time, no. and we were like freaking out on on release date. Like I was like, I need to read it now. So we're we, like, gonna get spoiled on Twitter. I know. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> Back in ages ago, um, on like MySpace. Um, but then, so we went and books were expensive back then, like hell of expensive. So we went and bought it. Um, in the store and then we had two copies and we were like what do we do these are so expensive so I think we ended up like selling the other one like mm. it's a big deal I was down at the at a beat in a beach town in New Jersey and I remember one of the bookstores on the boardwalk was having a midnight release party so I went to it and I wrote about this on Hypable by the way earlier this month um mm -hmm. Uh, because this is the 15th anniversary of Goblet of Fire's release. And uh, I still have the box that the books were shipped in. And they were really cool because they say right on them, uh, do not open uh, before. It says not to be sold before July 8th, 2000. And it says Harry Potter 4. And it's like got a green font color. Oh. It was, they're really cool boxes. And I also have them for Order of the Phoenix and Half-Blood Prince. Um so, yeah, and I was uh, – how old was I? I was 11 years old. So staying up till midnight to get a book was kind of a big deal. Yeah, you know, I think I was – I must have been around the same age, and I read this book. There was the first one I read in English. Mm -hmm. So that was actually pretty fun. Yeah. It like, took me a long time. Up, I looked up the Danish Gobble of Fire cover. It's terrifying. Are they – is that where they're underwater? Like – Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh, the uh, Danish yeah. covers the are mermaids and they look guys. devilish. Like, oh, uh, I just pulled yeah. it up and I'm scared. This is terrifying. <laughs> um, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's this great. would never sell in America. <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember friendly. Not kid friendly. seeing the, the Mary Grand Prey covers for the first time. And I was like, what is this? Why do they look so weird? Because like, <laughs> yeah, I know, really it's realistic it's really shock. looking, you know? Yeah. Um, oh, one yeah. of them has Sirius Black as a dog yeah. in the uh, in the title. That's really cool. Um, so yeah, um, it's crazy to think it's been 15 years since Goblet of Fire. That's a nice, yeah. nice good anniversary. I know. I feel so old. <laughs> so then, five years later, on July 16th, 2005, Half Blood Prince, the book, was released. Yeah. And then July 21st, 2007, of course, was the was um, the Deathly Hallows book release. And then that was it for books. But then July was still a hot month for the movies. Half-Blood Prince was released July 15th, 2009. Deathly Hallows Part 2 was released July 15th, 2011. And most recently, July 8th, 2014, the official opening of The Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Diagon Alley, down in Universal Orlando. Oh, and I think Order of the Phoenix, the movie, came out right before Book 7, right? Like two weeks? Yes. Yeah, yeah that two was, weeks. Uh, that but was you a... watched it before, and you were like, that's so much fun. And then you watched it after, and you were, like, crying because Fred and George <laughs> and, like, everyone were dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's this wasn't... month in Harry Potter history. I think the biggest month. Probably. Yeah. And if, you know, we all use uh, Time Hop Now and Facebook on this day, my... Because there's also been a lot of Harry Potter conferences in the month of July. So Yes, that's true. My July is just filled with Harry Potter stuff. <laughs> you got to get Time Hop. i got to get it to, to... Time Hop's great. i got to authorize it. I see all of my friends always have really cool posts. Yeah. But, um, so now yeah. it's time for pen and paper are my priority. Uh, we have two things to talk about this week. First of all, J.K. Rowling shared something pretty interesting. As if we didn't always already love Hogwarts enough... <laughs> 
she confirmed that all wizards and witches attend Hogwarts for free. Oh, man. Why can't we go? So we did go, according to her. That's true. We yeah, and it was there. free. So <laughs> no wonder we didn't well, know no, the books were not free, <laughs> Selena, as you pointed out just before the that's books were true, not free. Yeah. So, so, so some people the school have... books weren't free. Right, so there's hidden costs to attend Hogwarts, but yeah, you know I what? Gotcha. Whatever. They gotta guys. buy wands. They gotta buy pets. You know. Yeah, whatever. It's still Andy. cheaper than most schools. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think I think it was it was cool to hear J.K. Rowling say this because it's just like, oh man, we love Hogwarts so much, and now this. So she said the Ministry of Magic pays for it. In, in case you were curious, who's who's? Yeah, well, they probably adopted the Danish system of um, <clears throat> paying for school, so. Oh, you guys are so lucky. Not to brag. <laughs> oh. And, but, um, and then the uh, other big thing that... As if she couldn't get any cooler. <laughs> just, just, just an example of, of, again, how people get her attention, and, and, and this will lead into Andrew's story right now, too. But, uh, but in that case, with the uh, Hogwarts tuition fee, Emmeline uh, at Emmeline Online one on Twitter said, My friends and I are having a super intense debate about the cost of tuition at Hogwarts. So that's uh, how you get noticed. So that's how that's how she got noticed is having a super intense debate. So maybe if we use those words again, that'll that'll or flatter her. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Andrew, tell your so <laughs> so J.K. Rowling was tweeting a lot last week about the BBC. Selena, could you give us a brief rundown of what she was discussing? Okay, do you have twenty minutes? No. Um. <laughs> so yeah, and I spoke on this actually on the Hunt Hype podcast as well, uh, which is the uh, you know that our general sort of entertainment uh, podcast. Um. <laughs> if I'm allowed to just throw that out there, uh, but so um, so basically, yeah, J.K. Rowling's been tweeting a lot about like back the back the BBC BBC memories. I love Red Dwarf, blah blah blah, and that's because in the UK the new government, which actually controls the BBC because the BBC is meant to be public service, like the government is supposed to be public service. They've released this basically announcement saying we're going to do a huge like. Um, potential overhaul of the BBC. We're going to look into their funding. We're going to look into their programming. We don't want them to be focusing on mu as, uh, so, mu so much effort on on popular programming, you know, things like Doctor Who and Sherlock and do mm -hmm. those little things that nobody loves. So, and they want it to become more niche, basically. And fans are like freaking out, like BBC fans all over the world are going, don't mess with the BBC, you know, because the government has always had this power, but they've, they've never threatened to act on it before. Mm -hmm. And people are saying it's censorship and it's like 1984 and they're going kind of crazy. So clearly, oh, wow. <laughs> so clearly J.K. Rowling is on team BBC in this case, you know. Right. So she's been tweeting. She was leading a storm of tweets, people sharing their favorite shows on the BBC. To, to remind us all why we love the BBC so much. Yeah. Shows like Because of the wealth of programming that they have, basically. They, they yeah. don't want them to be confined to just one thing. So J.K. Rowling was retweeting a lot of people's favorite shows uh, when they at replied her. And oh, I right, thought, right. Now we're going to get to the heart of the story. Sorry, yeah. sorry. It's not a <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you have more to say about it? <laughs> I, no, I found that to be very informative, and I did not know yeah. what this was all about. So thank yeah. you, Selena. Okay, well, Selena did a great job. So <laughs> J.K. Rowling is retweeting people. And I, I'm sitting in Starbucks and I'm seeing all these tweets come in and I'm like, okay, how do how, I want to suck up to JK Rowling? And the reason, <laughs> so I tweeted her, I said the casual vacancy, this was her book that was turned into a show for the BBC. And I did this as a, a joke for people who listen to MuggleCast because I thought only, only they would get it because they'd read that and be like, oh, Ha ha, Andrew's trolling J.K. Rowling because he hasn't read the book and he hasn't seen The Casual Vacancy. That's funny. So I wanted to entertain my followers. <laughs> so, But then, little do I know, J.K. Rowling retweets my tweet with asterisk blushes asterisk. And I'm sitting in Starbucks and I gasp. I'm like, oh, she just caught the bit. <laughs> She just noticed me. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it's for, like, a huge fat lie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I lied. And I'm like, gosh darn it. I've spent years talking about Harry Potter and tweeting J.K. Rowling about Harry Potter. And, of course, the one time she finally pays attention to me, it's about the book she I didn't even read. Yeah. Ugh. Go freaking figure. Right, because I remember tweeting at you. 
I said, did you enjoy the book version, Andrew? <laughs> yeah. And I have to thank all of our listeners because I got so many <laughs> messages of support. Everybody was very happy yeah. that she finally noticed me. So thank you to uh, everybody who... So it's somewhat bittersweet, but I'm sure you're still going to celebrate it forever. And yeah. How many uh, followers did you gain? Uh, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't, I don't think I gained any followers from that. Maybe I did. I don't know. But I updated my Twitter bio. I said, <laughs> made JK Rowling blush once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. So it was a it's great true. day for me. And, uh, you're going to have the t shirts printed, I'm sure. I see you know, Selena. a poster on your wall. July, 17th of July. That's going to be in all future this week in Harry Potter, this month in Harry Potter. <laughs> right. I'm adding it to the Harry Potter Wikipedia page. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew made J.K. Rowling blush. Yeah. So I, I, I promised on a previous episode that if she ever tweeted me, I would print it out on, on a shirt. And a couple of oh, my followers yeah. reminded me of that. So now I got to do that. <laughs> it's going to be a really good shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Just J.K. Rowling, quote, blushes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to figure out how to make it look good on a T-shirt, but I will. <laughs> so uh, that's... You get one of the listeners to draw you like a, you know, a J.K. Rowling chibi face just all like like smiling, like hee hee yeah. with the, the cheeks. Oh, that was Can okay. somebody do that, please? Can somebody draw a picture of J.K. Rowling blushing? And I will get that printed on the shirt along with this tweet yeah. that says blush. Yeah, like a cute little cartoon version. Oh, it was so good. Yes, a cartoon version. Please, anybody, thank you so much in advance. <laughs> Working on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I also, you know, we also got to keep in mind that there's a great Harry Potter fandom still alive and kicking. And I wanted to plug a, a short film that's coming out later this year. You guys may remember the short film Harry Potter. Uh, the Greater Good, it was called. And it was a short film about Dumbledore and Grindelwald's relationship. Oh. And it was released on YouTube in December 2013. It received 3 million views. It was a huge hit. Now, the creators of this are back with another one. It's called Severus Snape and the Marauders. So just based on that title, you know this is going to be something we've been clamoring for. A Marauder story. They released a teaser trailer. Earlier this month, uh, it's set in 1978, just after Harry Potter's father, James, graduated from Hogwarts. Uh, he and his friends, Sirius, Remus, and Peter, are celebrating at a bar, contemplating their place in the war they are soon to become a part of. When Severus Snape enters the same bar, James <laughs> Potter decides to do something about Snape once and for all. <laughs> so that's the synopsis. They have a Hashtag not a prequel. <laughs> <laughs> They have a teaser trailer out now. You can check it out on YouTube. Um, it's also on Hypeable. Um, and it, like I said, I spoke to the creators, and they said it's going to come out by the end of the year. That's what they're aiming for. So check this out. I think it's going to be a big hit like the first one. And it's it nice to see really people cool. creating. It looks really good, too. Yeah, I'm just thinking in the uh, in the preview of the video, it looks like uh, the, the James Potter actor looks a lot like Adrian Rollins. Like, he looks a lot like the movie James. And the special effects are great. Cin just cinematography-wise, it looks great. So I'm really looking forward to this. Glad to see yeah. the fandom is alive and well. Mm -hmm. So that's all we have for today's episode of MuggleCast. I want to uh, plug a podcast that I'm doing every week now. It's called Millennial. The hashtag is silent over at MillennialShow.com. I'm doing this with uh, MuggleCast alums Laura, Elisa, and Matt every week. Uh, the, the show is free. We offer a, a paid tier as well to get bonus content. Uh, like I said, millennialshow.com. We talk pop culture, politics, uh, a lot of personal stuff, and a whole lot more. I listen to it. I say as a listener, uh, anyone who's not listening to this, you should really check it out because as a non-American, pretty much all I know about America comes from Millennial and John Oliver. So that's <laughs> a pretty interesting America that, that's <laughs> that, I, Selena, that I know. Selena, thank you so much for saying um, that. It's such a good show. It's a re oh, really, you. really good show. And we actually talked recently about potentially having you on in the future since you do listen. What? Yeah. Oh. I, I said we need we need some subs. And since you're a listener, I thought you would be a good person so we'll talk about that, that would down be the road. fun i could offer like a non-american perspective and, yeah you know yeah <laughs> talk about the bbc and we can argue no, about definitely. the harry potter prequel more definitely <laughs> always and uh, eric and micah do you want to 
plug Game yeah, of Thrones? Now would be a good time to just mention that at the end of this month uh, in Orlando, Florida, uh, close to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter theme park, there will be Geeky Con, the first ever Geeky Con, but formerly Leaky Con. So there will be uh, a version of Mischief Managed Entertainment or Incorporated's convention, typically Harry Potter uh, specific or limited by the title, and this time it's it's broader. It's a broader convention, but Micah and myself and Zach, who co-hosts Game of Owns, will be there to do our Game of Thrones podcast as well as Game of Thrones programming. But I've seen the schedule, and I can guarantee people that there are still a lot of Harry Potter-themed, Harry Potter-centric uh, panels and programming and discussion taking place at the Orange County Convention Center. So basically from next Wednesday, which is the 29th, is their Evening in the Park event, um, separate ticket event, which I will not be at. But on the 30, uh, 30th, 31st, 1st, and 2nd is the convention and I know Mike and I will be there. And if you are a MuggleCast listener in the Orlando area, there's not a specific meetup that we've been able to organize. But in general, we'll be there, and we would love to see you. And if you see us and happen to be there, don't uh, hesitate to come and say hello. Yep. The, the show specifically is on Friday, July the 31st at 2 p.m., um, on the main stage, we're actually going to be joined by uh, David J. Peterson, who invented the Dothraki language. Oh, so awesome. for those of you and Game Valerian. of Thrones fans, I yes. just think Valyrian's like a better <laughs> like he invented or, uh, you know, Valyrian, which is much nicer <laughs> sounding. Um, yep. And I don't know. There we go. So we look forward to seeing you if you're in the Orlando area. Oh, and if you're not a Game of Thrones fan, we have the perfect show for our perfect uh, panel for you prior to our main stage event. Uh, we'll be doing at noon on the same day, not on main stage, on a, on a separate uh, panel room. We'll be doing Westeros 101, which is like your introduction to the Game of Thrones series. So you could actually, in one day, figure out all you want to know about Westeros and then attend our most current actually you know what you'll be spoiled don't do that but we're, we're both at at 12 for the Westeros 101 and if you have been watching and are keeping up on Game of Thrones check out our uh, main stage show at 2 p.m. by the way that reminds me I ran into a listener of ours who's been listening to MuggleCast forever named Gabby uh, at a Barnes and Noble and a random town I used to live in of all places uh huh late last week so shout out to you gabby she's a huge fan she listens to uh millennial and a couple hypable podcasts now as well but uh she her gateway was muggle cast of course so shout out to you <laughs> it's always nice hearing uh that from listeners too even over at game of bones they say hey you know i've been listening to you for for a decade and and next month is is going to be the as you said earlier the the 10th anniversary of of muggle cast being a thing right that exists and that is that's insane guys 10 years can you just like that's crazy 10 years a where podcast. has the time gone i know how are we gonna and celebrate podcasting it? is 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 having its second wind right now you know i, think we should just, I love most yeah we yeah. should just re-release andrew you should just re-release the first episode ever as a new episode <laughs> <laughs> but let's uh, play it in the background the entire time we're doing episode 200 we, oh, we could do we could do a podcast episode you could respond commentary. to yourselves we could do a podcast episode <laughs> commentary episode <laughs> oh i love this part when i sniffled or coughed <laughs> oh as we all did so often when we were teenagers <laughs> yes yes our voices have deepened our love for Harry Potter has only grown. What else has happened? In case there are <laughs> listeners out there who have been with us since the start, since the first couple, we'll, we'll, we'll extend it, first couple months, uh, they're leading into the fourth movie release, our first live show in New York, all that good stuff that happened back then. Um, for those of you who have been with us that long, thank you. Next month's celebrations will be all about you as much as us because I think it was really our first listeners who helped shape the show. Too. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll we'll do some cool listener feedback stuff over the next month. So keep so speaking of that, keep an eye on twitter.com slash mugglecast and facebook.com slash mugglecast because we will be asking you guys questions and we would love your answers. Thank you everybody for listening. As always, you can go to mugglecast.com for everything you need to know about the show. And uh we'll be back next month in August for a tenth anniversary special. Bing. With JK Rowling. 
<laughs> not with J.K. Rowling. Oh. Unless, Sweet. unless we talk, I talk to her about the casual vacancy again. Maybe she'll pay attention to me again. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew Sims. I'm Eric Skull. I'm Micah Tannenbaum. And I'm Selena Wilkin. So Micah, next- did you just say your name differently? Tannenbaum. Did I? Tannenbaum. <laughs> Tannenbaum. I don't know. Maybe I cut out a bit. Tannenboom. <laughs> Sorry. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Ooh. See everybody next month. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.